This is the vice president of the National Farmers Organization, Bob Arndt of Minnesota, who is introducing Devon Woodland, president of the NFO, at this 1980 convention at Cincinnati. From Blackfoot, Idaho, Devon. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I thought for just a moment he was introducing another speaker. As I was sitting here listening to the senator, I drew the conclusion that we had the same speechwriter. He spoke of Ben Stong, and I want to spend just a minute about talking about Ben. You didn't know him, but you read him. And because of his writings in Your Reporter, The Washington Wire, and many more featured articles, you knew Ben. And if there'd only been some way to get him to the fountain of youth and take him back 40 years, he would have been invaluable to this organization. He was involved in all the farm movements as far back as I can remember and beyond. He talked about the holiday movement, the efforts to organize farmers. He saw them come and flash and go, and he analyzed why they did. And then we had said, and he had cautioned us on things that we ought to do to keep the momentum and the movement going forward. And I sat with Ben one day, and, you know, we try to uh, analyze how things are going and what to do better. And I said to Ben, Ben, uh, do you think we'll make it? You know, we have those questions too, along with you. And I said, Ben, do you think we'll make it? Do you think there's a chance? Well, he said, you know, history says you won't. But history also says you should never have whipped the SEC. And you did. History says you should never have been successful with the IRS, and you were. Well, he said, I'd have jumped out the window. But he says, you were successful, you proved history to be untrue, and you may well do it again. <clears throat> now, I want you to reflect on the theme of the convention that you see to my rear, complete bargaining for agriculture, and let's analyze that just for a moment. You have a vested interest in this organization, its goals, where it's headed, what we want to achieve and attain, and you have now available to you complete bargaining for agriculture. All the major commodities, some of the minor, programs designed that will give you the opportunity it won't do it for you, but it will give you the opportunity to determine your own destiny if you will but take a hold and put your hand on the wheel and help push. The programs are there. They're not fine-tuned to perfection, but the programs are there and are available that will give you the opportunity to control your own destiny. Complete bargaining in all phases. We are now under contract with nearly all major companies in America. We have established ourselves as a reputable supplier of agriculture commodities. And we want to be the supply of agriculture commodities for this country. We want to be the source of markets. Those are the dreams and the goals that lie out there ahead, and we're on the second, third, and fourth rung of that ladder, moving on toward that ultimate goal. Never lose sight of that. Never compromise principle. And if we're accused of having tunnel vision, being narrow-sighted, I think we need to pride ourselves in that, because too often as those goals become extended in our ability to reach them, the first thing you know, we lose concept of what we were trying to do, and we begin to compromise some principles, and before long, if we're not careful, we have faded and lost sight of that goal. That goal, and I want to remind you of it, is at some point 
establish our right to price what we manufacture. That's the goals of the organization. There will be intermediate goals that we will pursue to protect our ability to reach the ultimate goal. But the goal that has been established years ago has never been lost sight of, and that is to be the source of agriculture markets, establish our right. Now, every manufacturer in America does, with the exception of agriculture. Those who manufacture automobiles, tractors, whatever the implement or commodity may be, they determine its value, its worth, and then announce to the world the purchase price. And all we're asking is that as we live in the same society with other industry, that we too have the same right to manufacture based on cost productions announced to the world. The asking price, the price that they must pay. Those goals are honorable, and we ought not to lose sight of them. Now, I'm going to talk for just a moment about some of the temporary solutions to agriculture, and then I want to talk about some of the permanent solutions that lie ahead. And I think we have some responsibility to talk to you about the things that we see happening and developing, and then also talk to you about how to evade and avoid and keep those things from happening. We're living in a political atmosphere right now. It's uncertain as to what's going to happen as far as the Secretary of Agriculture is concerned. Oh, we hear a lot of names and we hear a lot of rhetoric. We hear a lot of discussion and proposals. I think I've been approached on at least a half a dozen different names as to support and our interest and our willingness to support those. We're going to be watching very carefully. Our concern is that a man who may, may represent the Board of Trade or the Mercantile or Agribusiness in some area may get the appointment. That isn't the type of person that we want there. We want that bona fide farmer and rancher who has touch with the soil, one who has the ability to feel the pulse of agriculture because he senses it himself. And of all the names we have heard, and we have reviewed and studied and researched those names as best we can and talked to the people in our states who know personally these people, who have been in meetings and held discussions with them. And at this point, the most acceptable at this point to this organization that we have knowledge of, and there may be others that come forth, would be John Block from Illinois. one who has a direct tie to the soil and whom has an open mind and some willingness to defend and fight for the rights of farmers and ranchers. Be that as it may, it still remains unknown. But we know some of the political rhetoric that took place during the presidential campaign, and we know that agriculture wasn't talked about. And I tried repeatedly to draw them out and get commitments as to what they had in mind for agriculture. They were very vague and evasive and had little or nothing to say of substance. And I think that that ought to prove as a warning to us that agriculture and its importance to this country and the minds of the public planners has faded. It's been taken for granted too long. And we're expected to provide a service and take whatever is offered. Well, in the way of a temporary solution, and let me emphasize the word temporary, we're talking about now and we'll become involved in a farm bill discussion, hearings, debates, and all that goes with trying to implement some acceptable farm program. The Board of Directors met some months ago, and we decided and endorsed a statement, and that is that we need a totally new farm bill, that we really don't have one, we really don't have a program, because back 30, 40, 50 years, farmers have the same problem they have today. 
and the programs and bills are antiquated. They've had band-aids and patches put on them and loopholes left where scrupulous people have had the ability to slip in and under. And we think it's time to scuttle that farm bill and program and start all over. The Secretary understood this, and many of you are involved in the structure hearings off across the country, and you presented testimony, and it was summarized, we presented. That's all out the window now pointing out again that any type of solution that you may achieve in the political arena will be temporary. And every four years you'll have to go in, defend, debate, and reestablish your position. And that's not the kind of farm program we want. We want a permanent farm program, and we have asked that these measures be considered that there be a minimum market level placed under agriculture commodities comparable to the minimum wage law, that that minimum market level be placed there to keep the producer from being exploited, and the American farmer is being exploited. The minimum wage law was established to keep the employer from exploiting the employee. And this will not increase the tax load on the American people. That minimum market level would respond at the marketplace. This now would give us some degree of stability and permanency in a farm program. We think the farm loan program ought to be protected. But we think there ought to be some protective measures in it being that non-farm corporations not not to have access to those funds. Absentee ownership of farmland ought not to have access to those funds. And there ought to be a limit placed on any single applicant and how much is available to him. Some restrictions on the loan program. And yes, then we're going to go farther. We're going to protect our export position we think it's vitally important that that program be protected and made available to farmers and farm organizations that they can be involved in and be recipients of that market that's developing that will continue to develop. And we have increased exports in this country from $6 billion to a year to the 40 now, and projections are that it will continue to increase, and as of today, we're 10 years ahead of the projected exports by the analysts. The demand for food is greater than we anticipated that it would be by 10 years. Yes, we know that productivity per acre has peaked out. The land is getting tired, and we've injected all the stimulants that we know how into it, we used to average a 3% increase per acre output. It's now down to one, and in some areas it has even decreased. Yes, demands on American agriculture, the farmer and rancher, is going to be greater in the decade ahead than it has in the past. The opportunities for this organization to step into a role of leadership in this country and the world has never been greater. And we must prepare ourselves to take that courageous step. We're going to be protecting agriculture bargaining, the very foundation upon which this organization was constructed. And any attempts to weaken farm bargaining, collective bargaining, that's permitted to us under the Capra-Volstead Act, we will be very vocal. That is our turf. And if a battle is called by those from the outside and even from some of those within the inside of agriculture, we'll be there to battle. We think it's unfortunate that the American farmers in this country have to go to the Federal Treasury for a portion of their income. 
These are some of the temporary solutions, farm bill programs. And I want to hasten to say that a farm loan program, whether it be disaster, crop insurance, whatever it may be, it's a poor substitute for farm income, people. I sit on a panel just in the last few weeks down in the Deep South. In that meeting, we had all the commissioners and directors of agriculture from across the United States, including Canada and Hawaii. We presented our programs to them and then sat in a question and answer period for some two hours. And as I sat and listened to some of the discussion from other farm leaders, I couldn't believe some of the things that I were, was hearing. One stood and says, we have a cheap food policy in this country, regardless of who's in the White House, granted. But the, the American farmer would have to organize his farm. He would have to prepare to produce and deal with a cheap food policy at the marketplace because there was nothing he could do about it. And when it came my turn to ask other members of the panel, I said to him, I can't believe what I'm hearing, that a leader of one of the major farm organizations would accept defeat. And I want an explanation. He didn't shake hands when he left. <laughs> Another stood and said, we don't want stability into agriculture and agriculture markets. We like the thrill of the market and the gyrations. And my recommendation is to him, if he wants those thrills, go to Las Vegas. <laughs> I'll gamble with the weather, disease, but I'll tell you, I don't want to play a game when the cards are stacked. And as the game goes along, the guy that stacked them changes the rules. <laughs> the American people have had a bargain in food supplies, have never recognized it nor appreciated it taken it for granted because we have let them. We have taken that position and that role as a supplier of that vital commodity, and we have never taken and demanded from them that food be a top priority. That top priority must now be recognized by the American people as it is around the world. Projections are that by the year 2000, 20 years from now, we may well not be an exporting country. We're living in times of plenty as far as the food supply goes, but we're also living in the times of a shortage as far as income goes. The American people are paying 13.9 cents or percent of their dollar or disposable income for food, the lowest in the world. And if you add to that liquor and tobacco, it then jumps to 16.5. But for food items, 13.9. And as I sat an interview the last few days, one asked me, what would you have to have? What would the American farmer have to have to receive his cost of production? Well, I'll tell you what I told him. Out of that 13.5% or cents of their dollar, he's getting five cents. And all he needs is two more cents or a 40% increase. If it could be passed through directly to him, but you and I both know that Someone reaches out and grabs a percent or a part of any type of an increase. There's one way you're going to get it, people. And you can appeal 
to the American people and educate and try to get them to understand, but I'll bet you they're no different than you are. They're no different than my wife in talking about their butterball turkey. She found one for 50 cents a pound, and that's the one she got because there was a distressed sale. They had an oversupply. And those who buy from you and I are going to do the same thing. No buyer of any commodity is going to pay more for what they buy than they have to. And you're going to have to get in a position, and this is a poor choice of words, you're going to have to get into a position to make them. During the campaign rhetoric, the president-elect talked about the free market system, talked about how that ought to be the influence in agriculture markets. And I hope that it comes as no surprise to him, but there are no free markets in this country. You have organized buyers buying from disorganized sellers. There was a period of time when you had a free market system, and that's when you had a multitude of buyers. But today, you narrow down the major buyers in this country, and you can put them all on one hand of any commodity, any industry. You can put them on one hand. And so you have an organized element that you and I are dealing with, and as a disorganized group, we will be the loser. And the only solution is for us then to use the same principle that they do, and that's to organize ourselves so as you go at the bargaining table, you have power there to extract and negotiate contracts that will provide a service for both. There is no other way, people. You really have no alternative to what's being offered by this organization. And we have a tremendous responsibility. I sat with a group of young college students not too long ago in my own area. By invitation, they wanted to better understand this organization and what we projected as a solution to what they knew was a dilemma, what they knew was an impossible thing, and try as they may, and the desire ran high, they wanted to become involved in agriculture, and they recognized that there was no way for them. And I asked them two or three questions, and they were these. How many of you have a farm background out of 50 young men and three young ladies? Every hand went up. How many of you someday want to own your own farm and ranch and till the soil as an owner-operator? Every hand went up. And then I asked the bell ringer, have you made plans to cause your dream to become a reality? How are you going to cause it to happen? And they hung their heads. They can't do it. They have no way to do it. They're depending on us to design a program whereby they can be incorporated into the agriculture industry. And if we fail, we may be well the last generation of owner-operators in this country. And our responsibility is to make it possible for those young people who have the know-how, the desire, who are bona fide farmers and ranchers at heart and want to be owner-operators. But you know, the average age of the American farmer today, and I'm not talking about the one that sits on the tractor, I'm talking about the one that holds the deeds, that owns the land, is 64 years of age. 64 years and Projected by some that in five years we may well only have 500,000 farmers in America. These things don't have to be true, but these are the trends and the projections. And if we sit idly by uninvolved, they will most surely happen. And we are the only burr under the saddle. We're the only thorn that's keeping those things from rolling more rapidly. Oh, they're rolling. But if we weren't there to give some opposition, some hope, some alternative, they would be rolling much more rapidly. 
Yes, if the average age of the American farmer and rancher who owns the land is 64, there will be a title transfer. Where is that title transfer going to go to and who will be the recipient of that piece of real estate? Will it be a young man who's paying 18 to 20 percent interest? Prime capped out, bumping 18 percent. That's only two points off the all-time high a year ago. It's projected this time that it will go equally as higher, higher, and will not roll back. But never again will we see that cheap rate of interest that we think now was cheap, then high. Will that transfer of land go to that young man who has no market assurance, protection, or guarantee, no contracts? If I were the 70-year-old gentleman, I'd think twice. And if I wanted to make a solid sale, I don't know whether I could sell to a young man under today's market conditions. This means then that we must design a system where that young man can build confidence in his own ability to operate and establish confidence in the minds of those whom he may be procuring farms and ranches from. And if we don't give that stability and some degree of security, most surely we will have failed as farmers and ranchers in this country. And we'll hang our heads if this happens. We know what the cost of operating a farm is going to be, what the projections are. The projections are by 1985 you will have a 50 percent increase in the cost of equipment alone. In the next 20 years, projections are that farm debt will reach a trillion dollars. People, there is no plans to retire farm debt. In 1950, we had 12 billion. The senator figures today, December 79, 158 billion. There's no plans to retire farm debt. Projections are that if you borrow $100,000 a day to operate a unit, by 1985 you will be borrowing 150000 to operate the same unit. And the programs that are being offered to retire that debt are only farm bill programs which are temporary where your standard of living and your income will be debated before the Senate and the House and your standard of living will be in the palm of their hand and there's not another segment in our society that goes that route to acquire a standard of living. We look at the Board of Trade and there are those that think that therein lies the salvation. Well, I'll tell you, if it's such a good place, I think we ought to put automobiles on it. I think we ought to put labor on it and other segments of our society, not only commodity futures. Well, we need to talk about then for just a few moments What's right about agriculture? We can't talk about what's wrong. We need to talk also about what's right. There's a lot of good things in agriculture. One of them is that you and I today own the land. We're on the farms. The industry is ours. And we're professionals. We're the best in the world and we're the envy of the world. Nobody can do what we can do. Nobody ever has in any generation before of any country in the world. And as they look at our ability to produce quality, certainly we use technology and all the assists, but as they look at our ability, they become envious of the American farmer and they rely very heavily on him. He's a professional. He's perhaps the most complete rounded individual that we have in America today. Oh yes, we have specialists in this country, but on that farm you have 
technology, you have professionalism. You become a soil analysis. You must know your herbicides. You must know your insecticides. You must know your fertilizers. You must be a veterinarian. And I challenge anyone to come from any other industry and have that well-rounded background that you and I have as true bona fide farmers and ranchers. Those are the good things about agriculture. We have increased our output per man, dating back to World War II when we produce for ourselves and three others today, we produce for ourselves and 60 other people. No country in the world has ever, no industry in this country has ever, nor will they ever, reach that type of output per man. Yes, those are the good things about agriculture. How do we deal with permanent solution now to what we have talked about? You heard department directors talk to you today, and you'll sit in conference with them tomorrow, hour after hour after hour. And they'll tell you point by point what we must do if agriculture is going to survive as the basic industry of America in the hands of the owner-operator. And you know, the only thing that makes this country great and different from other countries basically is the ownership of land, ownership of property. That produces an incentive for people, but the incentive gets kind of thread-worn when you do it for nothing. And so that incentive must be restored so that the farmer and rancher can and will stay on and produce. I want to touch on each of the departments for just a moment and give you some idea, and I want you to take a look at the front of your brochure that you have with you. That brochure there on the front outlines to you what you really have. And there are many more, but these are some of the things that are unique and available to you as a member of this organization. Yes, you have the update of information, reporting on the organization. You have programmed marketing in grain, orderly marketing, a phrase which we coined years ago is now common knowledge and in the verbiage of industry, orderly marketing. So we change it again to programmed marketing. This means that you decide the needs of your cash flow. You make that grain available consistently over the period of that crop year. Now this has many advantages. It gives the department some ability to bargain have some ability to look forward, to coordinate transportation to maximize all the capabilities that the department has to operate with. And too often when we rise in the morning and the sun's shining just right, we decide that we want to do something on the spur of the moment. And it doesn't make good business sense. And so as you look at some of the grain program, you'll find that the five-year program, program marketing, and yes, the goals that were announced to you today, that every county ought to set for itself a goal of a million bushel. And then as that goal is reached, there would be a service center established which would coordinate the paper flow make the logistic arrangements for the movement of that grain. And as you have heard in reports today, those massive stocks of grain that we have been hit over the head with and held above us as far as allowing market to escalate are no longer there, people. They're gone. They're gone, and I think they will never return again if we respond to the demands of the world. As far as embargoes go, yes, I think that we'll probably see more of them. Hopefully not. The 
The president-elect suggested he would lift it. I hope he does. He's having second thoughts when he sees the supply and the needs of this country. But I'll tell you, if the American people are not willing to pay adequately for the supply of food that we make available to them, I think we ought to start looking for other markets. <laughs> Brown County, South Dakota, Houghton. I spent some time with them, I think, last week or the week before. They accepted the challenge. They had put at that point two million bushel of grain in that county together. They had it in section one and it was ready to move. They had it programmed out for unit trains beginning January. That's the program. That's what will make it work. I heard Congressman Finley stand here today and he talked about the possibility of the price support program for dairy, the 80% of parity concept, that he introduced a bill that would suggest flexibility to the secretary. Do you anticipate, anticipate that flexibility would have been up or down? That's where it had been. There would have been fec flexibility in it, but it wouldn't have been up. It would have been down. Now, people, we have to make up our mind what we're going to do. Are we going to be panhandlers and walk around and plead and beg and ask for our income necessary to retire debt? Are we going to take and design a program and extract it at the marketplace? You're going to make that decision as leadership in this organization we are going to coordinate that movement, and I submit to you that we are of the frame of mind to extract it. <laughs> the meat department gave a report to you today, and in talking to them earlier, this has been an unusual and a tough year as far as cattle are concerned, a lot of frustration. We saw things happen that had never happened before to our knowledge in the cattle industry. We sensed what was happening, but we had little success in correcting it. And that was the major buyers of cattle, feedlot cattle, because of high interest rates they were not going to buy ahead. They were going to take a gamble on interest rates dropping. They weren't going to set money aside and pay interest on that for purchasing. They were waiting for that winter storm to come that would force the cattle out of the hills and into the market, and then they would take them at a fire sale or a salvage. It almost worked. It did work to a degree. We saw that market break. We had blocks of cattle put together. And for the first time in the history of the organization, in order to sell, we had to break up blocks because they had only buy one load at a time. I'll tell you, last year we was organized, this year they were. And we were disorganized. The cattle department has done a fabulous job in handling that chaotic condition. It hasn't been easy, and we have been able to move most of the cattle that we had available to us to move. We can still find and locate buyers, but I'll tell you they're not as plentiful as they was a year ago because of the uncertainty in the cattle market. You heard a report from the finance director today, and you'll see and learn more tomorrow. But I'll tell you, our accounts payable have been reduced substantially. And our credibility with our suppliers is at an all-time high. And our accounts payable to you as members in the loan programs, 
Some of you have had a surprise, a pleasant one, and we hope to give you more. Be patient with us. We're taking care of them, and we'll take care of all of them. You heard a report today from the trust. Administrator, the business approach that we have taken in there that, and I'm going to be very frank, the banks that we deal with didn't like, is that we initiated a program that was perfectly legal within the bounds of the trust agreement. We had inter-trust borrowing and we have taken the first step toward becoming our own bank in handling our own funds. <laughs> and minimizing our need for outside capital to operate our programs. Uh, people, this is a big step, and we appreciate those whom we have worked with, and we'll continue to work with them. But an organization must take a step at some point where it does not become totally reliant on outside sources of capital, and we have taken that step. The battle's not easy, and it's not going to be short. It's never going to be totally won. And if those of us who may have the opinion that someday it'll all be over and we'll be laying in clover, forget it. It'll never happen. We'll be negotiating across the tables with industry who buys commodity from this day forward. And the contracts of necessity must change because of the uncertainty of supplies that we must buy, it will change our cost of production figures as often as input costs change. We have no control over input costs, and so as you consider your costs of production, it becomes a very evasive issue, and so contract negotiations will change just as frequent as input costs cause it to change. Now we know how. We know how to cause competitive, a competitive atmosphere. We know how to cause competition to exist and generate between the major companies. Our experience of 20-some years has taught us some things to do and some things not to do. And everything that we have done is not right, but that didn't stop us from trying. And if you're afraid of a mistake developing because of what we do, there are organizations in this country that don't make any mistakes, and they're not doing anything either. And I'm going to toss a challenge out to you tonight, and we'll spend more time on that as time goes on. How many county presidents we got in here tonight? All right. Hold your hands up. Keep them right there. How many representatives from other counties that don't have the president here are here? Now, every hand ought just about go up at that point. The county president is here. We have somebody from that county. I want you, after this convention is over, Go back to your counties, go into the county agent, go into the ASCS office, you find out how much grain is in your county. You find out how much meat in the form of hogs and cattle and sheep are in your county. You find out how much corn is in your county. Find out how much is there produced. Find out who those producers are. And then you go after 10% of it. Find out who they are and then go after 10% of the volume in that county. And people, we have counties that have as much as 75 and 80% of the commodity in their county within the structure of this organization. We don't have enough of those counties, 
And then we have counties that don't have any. And if we can average 10% of all the commodities in every county, I'll tell you we'll write our own ticket. Now we're not